one's gonna listen. No one's gonna listen. Insane. Insane. Yes. Why? Because, Kate. Because. No one. Um, no one is gonna care. Alright. You know how many Don Bradman um, biographies there were? Twenty-three. There were 23 biographies, and I don't reckon that the 23rd anyone really read. Right. It'll be like the 10 million. Why won't you let me interview you? I will, just to save you the humiliation of, you know, going out there and interviewing idiots. What, what's it about? <laughs> well, the impact of COVID-19 on your life. All right, I'll do it just because no one's going to listen. Welcome to The COVID Crossing, a podcast of art, heart, hope and happenings from the Macedon Ranges northwest of Melbourne. This podcast comes from and with a faith in humanity and a belief in equality, so no one is left behind. Feelings of sadness, frustration and fear are huge at the moment, and yet We also know we can transform them so that we cultivate a learning mindset, keep an eye out for the silver lining and become a more equal and earth-allied society as we all make our way to the other side of the COVID crossing. G'day and welcome to this first episode of The COVID Crossing. My name is Kate Lawrence and I am your host. This podcast is a mishmash and it has become so big that now it will be split into two episodes a week. Hopefully a wonderfully entertaining, comforting and thoughtful mishmash twice a week. Today's mix includes interviews from three people from the town of Macedon, where I live, about the COVID virus and its impacts on them as at the last week of March 2020. After coming back from the post office where I did these interviews, my 14-year-old son, Ainsley, who you heard at the start of the episode, on realising that I had actually embarrassed myself by interviewing people, he then refused to be interviewed by me. Instead, he began practising for if he is ever hounded by the press or in a police interview. How has the coronavirus impacted you? So, uh, no comment. Um, well, how has it impacted you? No comment. Also in this episode, we'll hear a chapter of the classic book, Seven Little Australians, read by Victoria Wells, my colleague and contributor. Victoria is from the shared reading non-profit To Turn a Page, and each week we'll hear the next chapter. After the chapter, Vicky and I have a chat about the book, and then there's a segment where I look at some other curves I would like to see flattened. And the final section is some tips and tricks, tools and sometimes books to help us get through the COVID crossing. So, as you can see, it's a packed mishmash, but hopefully worth your time. My motto is definitely production over perfection. And so I'll be publishing a podcast every Monday and Thursday until I can't or we are all on the other side of the COVID crossing. So let's get started. All right, I have been putting this off because it's kind of scary. And, you know, if your children think you're going to embarrass them, I might embarrass myself. So on the afternoon of April the 1st, I ride up to the post office in Macedon with all my recording gear. And after talking to Anne in the post office, I park myself outside 
and I wait with my microphone on a tripod that is definitely standing one and a half metres away from me with the other microphone. Excuse me. It's, would, you be, would you be interested in having a chat about what, what's happening with COVID-19 and how it's impacting you? Excuse me, would you be willing to have a bit of a chat with me? No worries. I know from experience it will get easier and that there are always people who are willing to chat. Just talk to me, neighbour to neighbour, but stand close to the microphone. Yep, you can count on neighbours. No, I've stopped looking for jobs. I've stopped looking at the news as much as possible and checked out for the day and just trying to be yep. calm. <laughs> yes. You been doing any cooking? No, I'm just about to start cooking now. What are you going to cook? Bolognese. Oh, yeah, we had that again the other night. <laughs> <laughs> to put in the freezer <laughs> right. for the next three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> well, I went into work yesterday, so I actually did the commute in. I was very nervous because of all the signs on the freeway saying, go home. Oh, really? <laughs> Pretty much. I haven't been anywhere. Yeah, so yeah, know. well, it was like, go home, save lives. And I was like... Oh. Uh, going to work to make money. <laughs> <laughs> That'll save my life. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it was a bit, it was a bit, uh, yeah, I think it's probably uh, making me question whether or not I will continue to work in the city. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yep. There's a lot of theories going around. Have you heard about the theories that this is all being done on purpose to slow society down and what effect it's having on the um, you know, emissions and all that kind of thing because there's no traffic and So that was my interview with Jess, my neighbour from my first day out with a microphone in my local town of Macedon There are a few more interviews we'll hear in this episode from that day outside the post office but more of them later Now let's have some bibliotherapy. Sit back and relax. It is such a treat to be read to. Here's Victoria Wells from To Turn a Page reading Chapter One from the classic book Seven Little Australians. Seven Little Australians by Ethel Turner. Chapter One, Chiefly Descriptive. Before you fairly start this story, I should like to give you just a word of warning. If you imagine you are going to read of model children with perhaps a naughtily inclined one to point a moral, you had better lay down the book immediately and betake yourself to Stanford and Merton or similar standard juvenile works. Not one of the seven is really good, for the excellent reason that Australian children never are. In England and America and Africa and Asia, the little folks may be paragons of virtue. I know little about them. But in Australia, a model child is, I say it not without thankfulness, an unknown quantity. It may be that the miasma and naughtiness develop best in the sunny brilliancy of our atmosphere. It may be that the land and the people are young-hearted together and the children's spirits not crushed and saddened by the shadow of the long years sorrowful history. There is a lurking sparkle of joyousness and rebellion and mischief in nature here and therefore in our children. Often the light grows dull and the bright colouring fades to neutral tints in the dust and the heat of the day. But when it survives play days and school days, circumstances alone determine whether the electric sparkle shall go to play will-o'-the-wisp with the larrikin type or warm the breast of the spirited, single-hearted, loyal ones who alone can advance Australia. Enough of such talk. Let me... 
tell you about my seven select spirits. They are having nursery tea at the present moment with a minimum of comfort and a maximum of noise. So if you can bear the deafening babble of voices and an unmusical clitter-clatter of crockery, I will take you inside the room and introduce you to them. Nursery tea is more an English institution than an Australian one. There is a kind of bond camaraderie feeling between parents and young folks here and an utter absence of veneration on the part of the latter. So even in the most wealthy families, it seldom happens that the parents dine in solemn state alone while the children are having a simple tea in another room. They all assemble round the same board and the young ones partake of the same dishes and sustain their parts in conversation right notably. But given the very particular and rather irritable father and seven children with excellent lungs and tireless tongues, what could you do but give them separate rooms to take their meals in? Captain Walcott, the father, in addition to his division, had had thick felt put over the swing door upstairs, but the noise used to float down to the dining room in a cheerful, unconcerned manner despite it. It was the nursery without a nurse, too, so that partly accounted for it. Meg, the oldest, was only 16 and could not be expected to much of a, be much of a disciplinarian and the slatternly but good-natured girl who was supposed to combine the duties of nurserymaid and housemaid had so much to do in her second capacity that the first suffered considerably. She used to lay the nursery meals when none of the little girls could be found to help her and bundle the clothes of the two youngest in the morning, but beyond that the seven had to manage for themselves. The mother, you ask? Oh, She was only 20, just a lovely laughing-faced girl whom they all adored and who was very little steadier and very little more of a housekeeper than Meg. Only the youngest of the brood was hers, but she seemed just as fond of the other six as of it and treated it more as if it were a very entertaining kitten than a real live baby and her very own. Indeed, at Miss Rule... That was the name their house always went by, although I believe there was a different one painted above the balcony. That baby seemed a gigantic joke to everybody. The captain generally laughed when he saw it, tossed it in the air and then asked somebody to take it quickly. The children dragged it all over the country with them, dropped it countless times, forgot its police on wet days and muffled it up when it was hot gave it the most astounding things to eat, and yet it was the healthiest, prettiest, and most sunshiny baby that had ever sucked a wee fat thumb. It was never called baby either. That was the special name of the youngest. Captain Walcott had said, Hello, is this the general? when the little red staring-eyed morsel had been put into his arms and the name had come into daily use although I believe at the christening service the curate did say something about Francis Rupert Bernard Wilcott. Baby was four and was the little soft fat thing with pretty cuddlesome ways, great smiling eyes and lips very kissable when they were free from jam. She had a weakness, however, for making the general cry and she would have been really almost a model child. Innumerable times she had been found pressing its poor little chest to make it squeak or even pinching its arms or pulling its innocent nose just for the strange pleasure of hearing the yelps and despair it instantly set up. Captain Woolcock ascribed the peculiar tendency to the fact that the child had once a dropsical-looking woolly lamb from which the utmost pressure would only elicit the faintest possible squeak. He said it was the only natural now that she had something so amenable to squeezing that she would want to utilise it. Bunny was six and was fat and very lazy. He hated scouting at cricket. He loathed the very name of paper chase. And as for running an errand, why, before anyone could finish saying something, was wanted, 
he would have utterly disappeared. He was rather small for his age, and I don't think he'd ever been seen with a clean face. Even at church, through the immediate front, turned to the minister, might be passable. The people in the next pew had always the uninterrupted view of the black rim where the washing operation had left off. The next on the list, I am going from youngest to oldest, you see, was the show Walcott, as Pip, the oldest boy, used to say. You have seen those exquisite child angel faces on Raphael Tuck's Christmas cards. I think the artist might just have dreamed of Nell, and then reproduction of a vision imperfectly. She was ten and had a little fairy-like figure golden hair clustering in wonderful waves and curls around her face, soft hazel eyes and a little rosebud of a mouth. She was not conceited either. Her family took care of that. Pip would have nipped such a weakness very sternly in its earliest bud. But in some way, if there was a pretty ribbon to spare or a breadth of bright material just enough for one little frock, it fell as a matter of course to her. Judy was only three years older, but was the greatest contrast imaginable. Nellie used to move rather slowly about and would have made a picture in any attitude. Judy, I think, was never seen to walk and seldom looked picturesque. If she did not dash madly to the place she wished to get to, she would progress by a series of jumps, bounds and odd little skips. She was very thin as people generally are who have quicksilver instead of blood in their veins. She had a small, eager, freckled face and with a very dark eyes, a small determined mouth and a mane of untidy curly hair that was the trial of her life. Without doubt, she was the worst of the seven, probably because she was the cleverest. Her brilliant inventive powers plunged them all into ceaseless scraps. And although she often bore the brunt of the blame with ecumenity, she used to turn around not infrequently and unbraid her for suggesting the mischief. She had been christened Helen, which was no way accounts for Judy, but their nicknames are rather unaccountable things sometimes, are they not? Bunty said it was because she was always popping and jerking herself about like the celebrated wife of Punch, and there was really something to that. Her other name, Fizz, is easier to understand. Pip used to say it whenever he had seen the ginger ale that effervesced and bubbled and made the noise that Judy did. I haven't introduced you to Pip yet, have I? He was a little like Judy, only handsomer and taller. He was 14 and had as good an opinion of herself as the poor of one of those girls as boys of that age generally do. Meg was the eldest of the family and had a long, fair plait that Bunny used to delight in pulling, a a sweet, rather dreamy face and a powdering of pretty freckles that occasioned her much tribulation of spirit. It was generally believed that the family, that she wrote poetry and stories and even kept a diary, but no one had ever seen a vestige of her papers. She kept them so carefully locked up in an old tin hat box. Their father... Had you asked him, they would have all replied with considerable pride, was a military man and much from home. He did not understand children at all and was always grumbling at the noise they made and the money they cost. Still, I think he was rather proud of Pip and sometimes, if Nellie were prettily dressed, he would take her out with him in his dog cart. He had offered to send the six of them to boarding school when he brought home his young girl wife but she would not hear of it at first they had tried living in barracks but after some time one of the officers quarters rose in revolt at the pranks of the graceless children so captain Wilcock took a house some distance up the Parramatta river and in considerable bitterness of spirit removed his family there they liked the change immensely for there was a big wilderness of a garden two or three paddocks numberless sheds for hide-and-seek, and best of all, the water. Their father kept three beautiful horses, one at the barracks and a hunter, and a good hack at Misrule. So to make up the children, 
not that they cared in the slightest, went about in a shabby out-at-elbow clothes and much-worn boots. They were taught, all but Pip, who went to a grammar school, by a very third-class daily governess, who lived in mortal fear of her ignorance being found out by her pupils. As a matter of fact, they had found her out long ago, as children will, but it suited them very well not to be pushed on and made to work, so they kept the fact religiously to themselves. Hi, Vicky. That was a beautiful reading. I so enjoyed listening to that. That was just wonderful. Um, can you can you tell me a little bit about your about shared reading? I can. Um, shared reading is quite an old concept. Uh, it it is a form of bibliotherapy. So bibliotherapy takes different forms, um, and this is just one of them. Shared reading is done in a group with one person taking the lead in the group, um, and that, it, that would be me. Um, I've been trained to be a shared reading group leader, and I went to the UK for the training um, at a place called The Reader in Liverpool, and they're really the leaders in shared reading circles in the world at the moment. Um, this particular kind of bibliotherapy uh, really investigates how people connect with each other through the text, but also with the text and also over time because we have such a rich, long heritage of written word in English that we can, we, if we read something that was written in the 14th or 15th century, we can still connect with it, especially if it's about universal sort of human emotions and themes. Right. Do you do it in the Macedon Ranges at the moment? Yeah? I do it in the Macedon Ranges. I work out of two neighbourhood houses, Woodend and Lansfield. I run a regular weekly group in both those two houses. No, um, not, not so regular at the moment. Not so regular at the moment, no. Um, <laughs> uh, we work during term times. We um, Sometimes we work on a theme for the particular term. So I've done one term we did all Australian short stories. Um, another time we did all women. Um, but sometimes it, it is just on a, a bit of a whim. We'll hear more from Victoria about shared reading and the work she does in other episodes. But now we'll have a chat about the chapter we just heard. Okay, so I might just recap on what happened. Yep. First chapter is an introduction to these seven children who live in one family. Six of them had one mother and she died and their father, Captain Walcott, has remarried a much younger woman who is barely older than the oldest of the children. So she's 20 and the oldest child, Meg, is 16. Um, and these children are completely unruly. And one of the things that really drew me to this text is that in the first few sentences, the writer, who is the narrator, makes it very explicit that we're not going to have a story about good children with paragons of virtue. We're actually going to have a story about naughty children who do naughty things because. That's how Australian children are. This was written in, it was published in 1894. So when Ethel Turner wrote it, she was only 21 herself. Wow. And I think she, she saw something in Australian young people that hadn't been described before. We talk about the era and the father, Captain Woolcott. Uh, the book no, makes no comment on anybody's kind of status or why they do things. I th and I think that was an, another reason why it interested me was because the story is being told and it's up to the reader to then bring what they do to it. Yeah. Judgment or understanding or 
their experience. Yes, and I, I think for us reading it now, you know, a hundred and so years later, I think there's completely different standards around older men, younger women, how you talk to your children, how you're expected to live. But the thing that stood out for me in that text is that even though he's obviously the person in charge and they defer to him and he makes the decisions, they're not scared to do the things that they do. They don't live in terror. So they're obviously much loved in that context because they're, they're, they're not brave. They, these are the things that they do and they don't see that the consequences are going to be so awful that they wouldn't, it wouldn't stop them from doing it. And we talk about the mother. Uh, when you first started reading, it, t- it takes a little while to get your ear in and there's not, you, you know, it's, it's a different way of speaking and so, you know, you just have to be patient with it. But it absolutely rewards as it gets going. I loved, I loved the idea of the baby and the, the new mother thinking of her, it, him, I think it's a boy, baby, as more of a, a kind of, kitten or you know some sort of plaything and or a curiosity I just thought that was wonderful uh and the way the children took the the baby although he's called the general all around the place I just thought that was a really um refreshing way of of describing mother mothering and we talk about what is not spoken in the book the other thing um that struck me there was only one reference and I was really glad of it of of location I mean yes Australia but there was that reference I think towards the end around they they moved further up I think when he got the house moved further up the Parramatta River but also I wondered uh, about traditional um custodians and owners of of that land and the the backstory that inevitably is in all of those and and still um and it's not in there, and but but just it just to remember, I suppose. Well, th- th- I had thought about that, but I thought about it at a different point. So right on the first couple of pages, where the author is describing about these children, and and why Australian children are you know, the way they are, she actually says something about they're not sort of cowtowed by generations of sorrows. And I thought, oh, actually, yeah, you can't see that. Yeah. You can't see the generations of sorrows. Yeah, that you're living on, that yeah. you're, 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 yeah, 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 right. So that's it for the seven little Australians in this episode. I can't wait for the next chapter, which we'll hear in a week's time. So not the next episode, which is on Thursday, but the one after, which is next Monday. Every second episode, we'll have a chapter. That's how it'll go for now anyway. It's all the work in progress. So now let's hear from another local randomly interviewed at the Macedon Post Office. Right. So you're a Macedon resident? Uh, yes. So How long you lived here? I've been here since October 5, 1999. Okay, so that's 21 years. Uh, yes, it is too. Yes. Um, and so what has been the impact on you of this COVID-19? Well, I've, um, I've already been tested and uh-huh. I'm fine. I've, well, I went to the Gisborne Medical Centre. What, well, why they did you go because uh, I felt you know because someone felt it was it was uh, more or less if you wanted to not be worried or because because I've got I know I've also got a problem because I've got to go into hospital right and they banned surgery right and I've got to go in April the eighth okay. at Werribee right but it always pays for me which was most important to go down to the Gisborne Medical Centre and then they said go down to Melton West and that's where they tested me. Okay. So I was clear. I had no virus. Right, that's good. How long ago was that? Oh, that's going back to Sunday, just gone. Okay. 
And uh, today I was over in Bendigo, so that was so I was out of the area today. What were you doing in Bendigo? I was going to the bookstore. Is it, do you have to go to the bookstore? Uh, well... Aren't you meant to be... Aren't we all meant to be, like, not going out and about? But some places they still open, although that's only if you've been uh, interstate or overseas, I was told. Oh, no, well, officers, are you, do you work? Have you been laid well, off? Oh, we were... Uh, yes, I was down at Jumbuck, Sheepskin and Leather, and it was important to know that to, as of today... We were closed right down at Gisborne, down at Jumbuck. So I knowing all along it wasn't that. It's only going to be some shops are going to be still opening, but not everyone. Do some, you work there? Ah, uh, yes, I do help help out there. Right, and uh, my mother's actually the manager and the oh, right. owner. Okay, yeah, but I do work there. Right, and she's closed. Yeah, she's closed. She was closed today. Yeah, so that'll be a worry for her. Well, you, well, when you're not going to be able to make your money, it's a very much a worry. Totally. After Benjamin, I spoke to John. All right, come on, talk to me. All right. So, so are you? A, where Where are you from? Are you from Macedon? Oh, about. Ten kilometres west of Say, Sorry, I didn't hear that. Ten kilometres west of that way. So right in the middle of the bush? Oh, not in the middle. Ten kilometres west. So, okay. So Bullungarook? No, Macedon. It's Blackwood Road, Macedon, which is that way. Okay, all right. Okay. okay. So it's not in Who the are bush. Who you with? Pardon? Who are you with? Sure, oh, yeah. I'm just a local resident who uh, is wanting to make a, a podcast about how this um, disease is impacting people. Right. So what, what impact is it having on you? Impact? Oh, very worried. The whole world is worried. Worried about people dying. Hmm. Yep. And are you, does it, is it impacting your daily life? Yeah, I'm worried. Are you worried all the time, morning yes, and night? Yes, all the time. All the time. I'm losing sleep at night. You are we're losing yes, sleep at night. Because I'm worried. Are you worried about family in certain situations? Yes, yeah, the whole family. And are they in different places that might contract Yeah, they're the in disease? different areas of Australia. Ah, in the, in the suburbs and things like that? No, they're in different cities yep. and country. Yeah. The whole of Australia. Right. Right. Um, so what do you do when you can't sleep? I get up and listen to music. What sort of music? Oh, bloody hell. Semi-classical. Semi-classical? Yeah. And does that help soothe Yes. You? Changes my mind and my thinking. So it helps you not worry? Yes. So did you come into town to get some shopping? I went into Sunbury Town Did to you? do some shopping and I picked up my mail from the post office, which I use, uh-huh. and I'm having a cup of coffee. Is that okay? That's very good. And right. you're waiting for a taxi. Yes. So you agreed to be um, to answer questions, but every question is annoying you. Well, it is because I'm worried about the whole world situation with the yeah. um, yep. okay. coronavirus. How long you lived in Macedon? A long time. Yeah? I don't live in Macedon. I live 10 kilometres west of Macedon. Yep. So how long you lived there? A long time. Do you think your worry helps at all? No, it makes me worry. More worry. Yep. Oh, God. I believe it. All right. Uh, anything else you would like to say about it or about... Oh, I hope the scientists find something to kill the virus. That's all. All right, thank you. What was your name? John. John. Great. Thanks, John. I really appreciate your time. All right. 
I wasn't at all happy with how my questioning seemed to be bringing annoyance and indeed more worry to John than connection and having a voice. But I'm so grateful for his voice, the purity and simplicity of his emotion and his solution was important for me to hear, despite his curmudgeonly nature. This last part of the podcast has two segments. The first is called Flatten the Curve, but it's not about flattening the COVID-19 curve. There's plenty of people talking about that, and we're all trying to do our bit to help with that. And it's not about the mountainous curves I have to ride up and down to get anywhere here, which I would love to have flattened. No, I'm talking about other curves I think we have an opportunity to flatten. Here it is. The curve we need to flatten is the one that has enabled the top 1% of Australians to own more wealth than the bottom 70% combined. The curve we need to flatten is the one that has wealth inequality at its highest level since the Australian Bureau of Statistics survey began over 25 years ago. The curve we need to flatten is the one where women earn 85% of what men earn and 65% of women do more than five hours of unpaid work per week and 60% of men do less than five hours unpaid work a week. The curve we need to flatten is the one that has seen company tax steadily decrease over the last 40 years. The curve we need to flatten is the one where a third of Australia's biggest companies pay no tax at all. We need to live up to our name, the common wealth of Australia, and truly be and fairly share the wealth of Australia amongst all its citizens. And the final segment is called Tips and Tricks, and it's all about sharing some ideas about how we might manage our thoughts and reactions um, to acknowledge them and yet move through the fear, sadness and frustrations. Here it is. Tips and Tricks. So I'm a meditator. I've been meditating since I hit a personal crisis nearly 20 years ago. I wax and wane a bit in my dedication, but I'm more on than off with it. And now I feel it intuitively if I haven't meditated for a little while. Meditation is the biggest single thing that has made a difference in my life in terms of my peace and happiness. It isn't a quick fix and it doesn't solve everything, but it is a tool that helps me get back to peace and reworking my thoughts to be more helpful. So here are my tips to meditating. Number one, commit. Number two, build a habit. Make it so small that you can't not do it and be consistent. It's better to do five minutes every day than half an hour every few days. Number three, commit. Don't give up even if you miss days or weeks. Just come back and begin again. Number four, start with your breath or some other bodily sensation. And as John Kabat-Zinn says, do that for a few years. Number five, it took me a few years to work out, but the end game isn't to sit and meditate. It's to bring the ability to be present through your body into your everyday life as often as possible 
because this is presence, uncluttered by the past or the future. This is peace. Number six, there is a great app called Insight Timer, and it has thousands of recorded meditations from hundreds of different people. There's also a timer you can set with bells and music in whatever way you want. And there's a whole section on sleep meditations. Quality varies enormously because anyone can load up a meditation. And of course, everyone varies in what they like. A few ones that I have found and liked are Kate James. She's Australian. So is Franco Hickey. Tara Bruck, uh, Jack Cornfield, Andrew Johnson and Sharon Salzberg. Number seven, commit. So that's all for this first episode of The COVID Crossing. The next episode will be out next Thursday and then every Monday and Thursday after that. That's the plan anyway. But as we all know, this is a time when plans can easily go astray. If you'd like to connect with us or other listeners, make suggestions or give feedback, please jump onto the COVID Crossing Facebook page. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're in any doubt that you should act even when there are naysayers in your life, I'll give Ainsley the last word. None of them are going to be the same as this. Yes, they are. Uh, exactly the same. <laughs> You've got no idea. I've got every idea. Thanks for listening to The COVID Crossing. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review it on iTunes and tell your friends about it and share it on social media. A huge thanks to Victoria Wells from Kyneton in the Macedon Ranges and also from the non-profit to turn a page. Her encouragement and willingness to participate have been crucial in getting this off the ground. And a huge thanks to the community of Macedon who've been willing to talk to me when I have a microphone in my hands. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Kate Lawrence. You can find out more about me at my website storyground.com.au